I have felt for a long time that the whole 19th and 20th century project of um, theology of the New Testament or theology of the Old Testament or theology of the Bible was an unsuccessful, completely failed enterprise because um, most of the time people were trying to do a descriptive work of the theology contained in the Bible, but they were also trying to read that to confirm their own Orthodox Christianity. But they were also trying to use purely histor historical criticism. So they weren't trying to be allegorical or do spiritual interpretation. They were trying to say, this is what Paul really meant when he talked about the spirit or faith or Christ or whatever, uh, or God. Uh, and yet then they seem to think that that justifies, let's say, a fully uh, Nicene or Chalcedonian doctrine of Christ or the doctrine of the Trinity. And I've always felt like that um, you can't read the no New Testament judging by the criteria of modern historical criticism and get truly robust Christian orthodoxy out of it. Because orthodoxy, in the full sense that I've been confessing it in church all my life, wasn't in the, <coughs> the New Testament historically. It took, t it took centuries to develop. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I am like, I think, most Roman Catholics and Episcopalians and a lot of other people in believing that when we confess the creeds, which we do all the time in church, whether it's the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the definition of Chalcedon or whatever, uh, when we say we believe these things, it's perfectly fine to say we believe these things without, without believing that the historical Paul even knew about them, much less taught them. So part of the book, the introduction of the book, is to try to trace the rise and the fall, um, or at least I'm hoping it's a fall, the secession of the discipline of theology of the New Testament. And then to say, but that doesn't mean that we can't read the New Testament or the Bible for that matter uh, and take out of it by our own creative interpretation fully, robustly orthodox Christian doctrine. A lot of the book drew out of my own experience of for decades being a historical critic of the Bible and a historian of early Christianity, knowing that the Bible is not historically accurate, it's not scientifically accurate, and, and yet I stand up, I, I teach that in my classes, and yet I stand up in Sunday and I say something like, I believe that Jesus descended into hell. Well, how can I say that? I'm still saying it, what do I mean by that? And I've, in my own mind, I've over the years, uh, made a difference in between historical interpretation of the Bible and theological interpretation of the Bible. And this book is an attempt not just to urge that, but to display at least my way of doing it. How do I make sense of the New Testament, uh, reading the New Testament, without limiting myself to historical criticism? In other words, allowing fairly creative interpretation and exegesis, uh, and yet reading the Bible so that it uh, supports and informs um, the full orthodoxy of the church that I'm a member of. And, uh, and so the book is my attempt to demonstrate that. And to argue that going forward in the, from now on, it's perfectly fine to be a Christian and not be uncritical from a historical point of view about the Bible. But we need to learn and to teach our fellow Christians how to read the Bible theologically and not just historically. Uh, there are two ways most of the time that people have organized theologies of the New Testament in the past two centuries. One was um, trying to do it canonically, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, so on. The other way would do it maybe chronologically. So you start off with Paul as the earliest and then you go. Um, and then some people have done it otherwise through uh, topics. So I decided to actually put a constraint on myself and say I'm going to constrain myself voluntarily to what are some of the classic topics of systematic theology that ten has tended to be Protestant more than Catholic. But, and so the introduction of the book is basically explaining what the theology of the New Testament was, how it arose, and my critique of it, and what I think should substitute in its place. And then the rest of the book is organized by chapters. The first chapter is knowledge on the epistemology, because one of the main things up through the whole book is how do we know what we know about anything? So the first chapter is kind of a theology of epistemology. The second chapter is scripture, and it's a theology of scripture. 
because of course I'm gonna be dealing with this text not as a historical document solely, but as scripture of the church. And then I follow very straightforward traditional uh, systematic theology topics. Chapter on God, the next chapter on Christ, the next chapter on the spirit. Then there's a chapter on um, theological anthropology. I just call it human. And then the final chapter is on the church. So it's ecclesiology. Um, those are somewhat organized just because God is where you kind of have to start once you get past the issues of what is scripture and what is knowledge. God is the first topic, I think, in most systematic theology. The church topic is last because I wanted to end up, I see the church as being the best place to talk about the future, eschatology. And so I put the church last for that reason. So I intentionally organized the book in a very non-biblical studies way and in a very traditional systematic theology way. So I could say, you really can do this. I've been working on this book for the last 10 years and so I've been talking about it a lot. And a lot of my friends would say, you're doing what? <laughs> you're writing theology? Yeah. Why are you doing that? Uh, I think it's because it's just a, it's, in fact, I don't, I don't hesitate to be somewhat autobiographical in the book. I talk about my growing up in a fundamentalist uh, Protestant church in Texas, small town Texas. From there, becoming dissatisfied that even as a teenager and eventually attending Princeton Theological Seminary, being introduced there to real historical criticism, which I found liberating, uh, gave me a way to think about the Bible in intellectual ways that I, I, at least I didn't experience it at the time as faith destroying, although I think maybe some of my friends did. Uh, and then I went to Yale for my PhD, and that, uh, I, th I think when I got to Yale, all I knew how to do was biblical exegesis. But I was at Yale in the 80s when uh, some of the greatest theologians were working on what was then called the Yale theology. I'm talking about Hans Frey, George Limbeck, uh, David, Tra uh, David um, Kelsey. Kelsey. Um, and uh, I, I really learned what theology was only by sitting on the, on, at the side not participating in, but listening to other theologians talk about what is theology if one were to do theology. And that's where I learned, and then I started learning how, to, how a theological thinking of the text was very different from the historical. I never thought that I wanted to stop the historical study of early Christianity because I found it interesting. And it, 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 it's not just that it's important, uh, although I, I, don't, I think it's important, uh, although I don't think it's necessary for Christian theology, uh, but I just liked doing it. Um, but learning, how, how theology could be done in ways that I hadn't really understood before. And that really happened in the five years I was a doctoral student at Yale. And then after that, I just always recognized that I was, I was doing two different sides of my own career. I was, from a scholarly point of view, I was being a historian or a textual or a cultural historian or a textual interpreter, but I was also continuing to go to church. And it took me a while to decide that maybe I should address that in my scholarship. Well, I'm not the first biblical scholar, for one thing, to talk about this kind of event. I'm thinking of um, A.K.M. Adam, who's published on uh, hermeneutical theory and scripture. Uh, so I've been in dialogue with other people about this. Um, uh, but the, there were four theologians who were the most important to me, mainly more about the theological aspects and issues. And it's interesting because all four of them, I'm not Roman Catholic, but all four of these are Roman Catholic theologians who are philosophically trained. They're all Thomists, that is Thomas uh, Aquinas is their main focus. They're all also uh, left-wing Marxists uh, for the most part, or at least left-wingers. And they all for our, uh, um, uh, they've all been, they all come at the study of Thomas from the point of view of Wittgensteinian ordinary language philosophy. And I just gravitated toward them because they just seemed to be so right um, about the meaning of language, how does language work, and what are the central aspects of, of theology. They all emphasize, for example, the centrality of uh, negative theology or apophatic theology. Uh, and that would be um, Herb, Herbert McCain, Fergus Carr, uh, Nicholas Lash, and then my Yale colleague, Dennis Turner. I read a lot of those four people. I also read a lot of my colleague at Yale, Kathy Tanner, um, but, and lots and lots of other people. For the first time, I found myself getting serious about Augustine, 
and Thomas Aquinas themselves. And then for a lot of the apophatic theology, um, Pseudo Dionysius, um, the Areopagite, was, uh, I discovered him through Thomas and through these other apophatic theologians. So there were ins inspirations from all over the place. It does. It, it's, uh, Episcopalians have tried to define themselves as a bridge between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism, but also when the Anglican Church start, first started breaking away from Roman Catholic, the Roman from Rome, um, the, the, a lot of those church divines, we would call them, in Elizabethan England and thereafter, they tried to go to the Eastern Fathers, Eastern Orthodoxy, to reclaim forms of uh, Catholicism and Orthodoxy that they thought would kind of help them jump over uh, the more recent Roman Catholic, what they would call innovations. Um, so the Council of Trent, for example. Uh, they, they wanted to, uh, Episcopalians, at least in the US, want to reclaim the most central aspects of Christian ca Catholicity and orthodoxy. They, and so I wanted the book to be uh, informed by that Episcopalian broad church orientation, which means I want it to be seen as, as orthodox by Eastern Orthodox Christianity, Christians, by Roman Catholic Christians, and by Protestant Christians. So for example, most of what I talk about uh, as Orthodox Christianity relates to the first several centuries of Christianity up to the great creeds, great ecumenical creeds. And I don't even talk about some of the things that come later, like the infallibility of the, of the, the papal infallibility or um, a, a lot of uh, the filioque. I talk a little bit about the filioque controversy, but just to say this was an unfortunate rupture between East and West that we probably could have avoided and hopefully we may be able to get over. So I think being an Episcopalian has made me want to be Catholic in the broad sense of that term. I spend a lot of time talking about <clears throat> how we should not think of the text of the Bible as some kind of epistemological foundation that we first set the meaning of before we then use it in a devotional or a theological or a doctrinal way. That base superstructure idea that history and the text provides the base and the superstructure is application, either theological or de devotional, whatever. I say, let's just get rid of that entirely. That's been the whole problem with, the histor his with uh, historical criticism and the role of the theology of the New Testament project. I also say we need to get rid of the idea that scripture is a rule book, is a manual, is a constitution, or any of those kinds of models. In fact, what I've used in a previous publication, my Sex and the Single Savior book, the very last chapter talks about, let's think of scripture as space we occupy it's like a cathedral you walk into. Does it communicate? Yes, but it doesn't communicate in any kind of agential sense, in a one-way sense. You, you interpret the space because of the space. So I'll talk about scripture as cathedral in that book. I also talk about scripture as a museum, an art gallery. The art has meaning, but you don't have to come up with some authorial intention of the artist in order to get meaning out of it. You go into an art museum and you just, you should really, the best way to do it is not, what did this artist try to do, but just say, what am I experiencing here? How do I interpret this? So I used that in the Sex and the Single Savior book. I also use the image in this new book of uh, scripture for Christians should not be a place we go to get answers. Scripture is the water we swim in. We are fish swimming in the water of scripture. That's how we need to think of it. You live in scripture. You don't go to scripture for a philosophical answer, for um, data, for information, for science, for history. As a Christian, you go to scripture, you just don't go to scripture, you live in scripture. So scripture is water.